Let me just finish up in Mark chapter 4. I didn't get to the fourth type of ground this morning. My wife pulled the plug on me. But let me just say that the fourth type of ground wasn't better than all the rest. You know what the difference was between the fourth type of ground and the first three that didn't bring forth fruit? It didn't have more. It had less. It had less hard-packed ground so that the seed could penetrate. It had less stones that the seed could put down root. It had less weeds to sap the uh, nourishment of the soil. The soil that produced was soil that had less. And I tell you, when the Lord showed this to me, it blessed me and encouraged me so much because I've never felt like I was the best at anything I wasn't sure I could be more, but I knew I could be less, amen. If the key was being less, if the key was having less doubt and unbelief and just less plugged into the world, I could do that. I was absolutely convinced of it. And this is really what bears fruit is just the simplicity of taking the word of God, planting it in your heart and not letting anything else come against it. Man, that is so simple. That is profound. And I want to illustrate what I've been talking about here in Matthew chapter 11. This is an instance where uh, John the Baptist had been put into prison after only six months worth of ministry. You know, this is amazing. This man separ was separated unto God from his mother's womb. He was baptized in the Holy Spirit while he was still in his mother's womb. And I just can't let this go without saying it, that for those who wonder about abortion and that's just a woman's body and it's not a, a life. God did not fill a hunk of flesh, a fetus with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist was a person and he leapt for joy in his mother's womb when she was only six months pregnant and he was filled with the Holy Ghost. That right there ends the discussion about whether this is a viable life or not. It is, a child is alive. And we've had over 60 million abortions in the United States, legal abortions. And we actually are in a position now to see that overcome. I don't know how many of you know, but the 1973 Roe versus Wade decision, the Supreme Court wrote in their decision and said, this decision is being, record, or being made based on the assumption that we don't know when life begins. And they said, if it could ever be proven that life begins at conception, then that life in the mother's womb has just as much right to protection as any other person. And that's written in Roe versus Wade. It's in there. It's part of the law. And since that time, there has been research done and there are now multiple states that have passed a law based on uh, life beginning at conception. One of the most famous ones recently was in 2018. I think it was Ohio that passed that law. Is that correct? Anyway, Iowa, maybe. But they passed a law and immediately the court system shut it down and it's working its way towards the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court rules on this, now that we have a major uh, majority there, uh, it would be very easy to say that Roe versus Wade would be nullified or at the very least they would kick it back to the states to make their own decision and this would end abortion as we know it in the United States. We've got a very good chance of seeing that happen. Man, that's something to praise God for. I tell you, that's awesome. There's over 60 million children been aborted in the United States and worldwide, the United States under Obama, one of the, the very first thing he did as president was to encourage and send money to foreign uh, countries to encourage ab abortion. And there were millions worldwide, who knows how many children have been killed and murdered and praise God, we've got an opportunity to see that change. So I just couldn't help but say that. But John the Baptist 
was thrown in prison after only six months ministry. He was filled with the Holy Spirit while he's in his mother's womb. And he didn't have a normal childhood like we did. He never went to school. He never had friends. He never got married. He was with a group of people called the Essens, the people that wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they lived in this desert area. And they were so legalistic, so strict that their laws, they've actually, the people that wrote these Dead Sea Scrolls, they've actually got scrolls of their, what their life was like. And these people were so strict that did you know it was against the law for you to have a bowel movement on the Sabbath? That was part of their law. They considered that work. That's not an exaggeration. I'm not making this stuff up. This is the way that John the Baptist was raised. He was raised so strict. He was focused on one thing. And after just six months, get a picture of this. After six months, he didn't go into the population centers and start preaching. He was out in the desert and he was just preaching to the scorpions and to the snakes and somebody heard him and got touched and they went and got another. And in six months time, he turned not only the nation of Israel, but Idumea and all of the surrounding nations, everybody in that entire area was, they had the greatest revival ever recorded in history. Everybody was looking for the Messiah. G John the Baptist paved the way for Jesus. It was important what he did. This is what his whole life was given to. But after six months ministry, he got thrown into prison by Herod because he was outspoken and told Herod that what you've done is adultery to marry your brother's wife. And he was thrown into prison. And we don't know the period of time that he stayed in prison, but it was probably at least six months. Could have been a year or two. And this man who was just a fireball and who had so much zeal, and I mean, he was... Uh, he was just, his whole life was consumed with this. This is what everything was about. After being put in prison for months or for years, he had actually begun to doubt whether Jesus was the Christ. And this isn't just a minor doubt. I mean, this was what his whole life was about. If he made a mistake in saying, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And when his disciples came to him, he says, he must increase, I must decrease, follow him. If John made a mistake, then he took the greatest anointing that had ever existed on a man in history and sent it after the wrong person. This was serious. This was a crisis situation. So I just say all of that to let you see kind of where he was. And it says here in Matthew chapter 11, in verse 2, it says, Now John had heard in the prison the works of Christ he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Man, when you take into account, he said boldly, This is the Lamb of God. He said it more than once. And when the Pharisees tried to get him jealous of Jesus, saying, Jesus is baptizing more people than you are. The whole world is going after him. Instead of being sucked into that pride thing and, and you know, feeling... Uh, intimidated because somebody had drawn more people than he had. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. He was before me. Man, he, he was absolutely convinced at one time. He had an audible voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son. He had a visible manifestation. You know, sometimes people will say, it says that the Holy Spirit descended as a dove and some people read that in Matthew's account and say it wasn't a visible manifestation. But if you read it in Luke's account, it says he descended in a bodily shape as a dove. There was a physical manifestation of the Holy Spirit as a dove descending upon Jesus. He had an audible voice from God, a visible thing, a witness in his heart, a total assurance at one time. And yet, after being in prison for a period of time, he says, are you the Christ? Or do we look for another? There's a lot of things you can get out of this, but one of them is that, you know what, it doesn't matter who you are. If you entertain doubt, you can doubt. It's like flying in an airplane and you think, man, look what I'm doing. I'm 40,000 feet. I'm going 500 miles an hour. Look at me. And if you ever turn off that power, I guarantee you, you'll sink like a rock. 
The moment you quit using your faith, unbelief, we live in a fallen world. We live in a culture of unbelief and it takes effort to maintain faith. I was talking to some of my Bible college graduates out there and they were talking about that they were just so transformed in school and they really tried to take it with them. But after, I don't know, five years or whatever, since they've graduated, they've just been kind of beat down that life has gotten to them and they just, they long to get back into that culture and stuff. And I'm not saying everybody has to live in a bubble, but I'm saying that this world will drag you down. And unless you make a deliberate effort to build yourself up, uh, it's natural. It's normal to live in unbelief. It's abnormal to live in faith. It's against this world system. And here's John the Baptist, who is the greatest man. We'll get to that in a moment. Jesus said, this is the greatest man that has ever been born on the planet. And yet the greatest man that had ever lived entered into doubt because of circumstances. And I'd have to speculate to figure out what all of it is. But just the hardship of being in prison, the desire to be reaching people. I know that if I was shut up in prison and if I couldn't be on television and putting out books and holding meetings and ministering to people, man, it would be misery. This is what I was created to do is to minister God's word. And I can relate to some degree how this must have felt. And it just didn't look like things were working out. Most people in these days believe that the Messiah was going to come and overthrow the Roman government. They got the second coming and the first coming of Jesus all confused as one. And they thought that when the Messiah came, he was going to establish his physical kingdom right then. We now know that the church age is in between his first coming and his second coming. And uh, so we now interpret it differently. But you can see a lot of instances where they just expected Jesus to put the kingdom into effect right then. And Jesus wasn't doing what John expected. He wasn't overthrowing the Roman government. He was preaching, you know, turn the other cheek, be merciful, that my kingdom's not of this world. And so... Hope deferred makes the heart sick. If he had the wrong expectations, he was setting himself up to make his heart sick. So from prison, he says, are you the one that should come or do we look for another? And look at Jesus. He said, Jesus answered and said unto them, go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached unto them and blessed is he whosoever will not be offended in me. You know, to me for years, I thought about how does that answer this question? Are you the Christ? And he says, go tell him what you've seen and he'll be blessed if he doesn't, uh, if he's not offended. And here in verse seven, it says, and as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, Keep your finger here, but look over in Luke chapter 7. This exact same thing is recorded there. And uh, there's, two diff there's two major things I want to point out. It's the same story. They don't contradict each other. It just gives a little different look at it, a different insight. In Luke chapter 7 and in verse 18, it says, And the disciples of John showed him of all of these things. And John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? When the man were come to him, they said, John Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured. Now the way that it's stated, see, shows that Jesus didn't even answer him immediately. He didn't even respond to this question. And in an hour's time, it says that in that same hour, he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, go your way and tell John what things you have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf, are raised, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to the poor, the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So when you look at this account, he didn't even respond at first. He just did these miracles. And in one hour's time, he says, go tell them what you've seen about all of these miracles. And then look at the way it says this in verse 24. It says, and when the messengers of John were departed, 
Over in Matthew's account, it says, as they were departing. There's no contradiction between the two, but the point I'm wanting to make is they were out of earshot. They didn't hear this. And listen to what Jesus began to say about John after the disciples of John were gone. He says, what went ye out into the wilderness for to see a reed shaken with the wind? You know, this is total sarcasm. What he's doing is saying, what drew thousands and thousands of people out into the wilderness? Was it the reeds blowing in the wind? They had been there for thousands of years and they had never had multitudes out in the desert. In other words, it was sarcasm. It, it wasn't the scenery that made everybody go out into the wilderness. In verse 25, but what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? It wasn't John's fancy dress that drew everybody. It was not his statement, his style statement that caused everybody to come out. You know, I've heard it said that the only thing that smells worse than, worse than camel's hair is wet camel's hair. And John spent most of his time in the uh, river baptizing people. I mean, he was a fashion statement. It wasn't his fancy clothes that drew him out there. That's what Jesus is saying. He says, behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. You know what that is? That's a reference back to Malachi chapter 3. And this is the last chapter in the Old Testament written. And it was saying that before God comes, he's going to send his messenger that will speak. And he says he will turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers to the children. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. You know, I don't know exactly what that means. I've never heard anybody else teach on this, but I've studied it. And it looks to me like God said, if John didn't come and accomplish his plan, and if he didn't touch these people, Jesus could have come and cursed the earth instead of redeemed the earth. Now, there's no doubt that God's plan was to send Jesus for the sins of the world, but there had to be some reception. And John was sent to prepare people's hearts lest God came and cursed the earth. So I say all of this to say that what John was doing was super important and Jesus knew it. He quoted the Old Testament passage and said, this is the guy that we've been waiting for for over 400 years. You know, if you were discouraged, if you were in prison and if you were feeling bad, how would it make you feel for the most important man on the earth, the one who was drawing multitudes of people and stuff to say, this man is the greatest man. He's the one that was prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus went on to say, he says, For I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. What a statement. You know, there was a time that Jamie and I were pastoring in Segaville. Texas and just, man, people were staying away from our meetings by the thousands and we were struggling and we were struggling financially through my own stupidity, but whatever the reason it was, it was bad. This is when Jamie was eight months pregnant and we hadn't eaten in two weeks and we had nothing but water. And it looked like not only were we going to die, our child could die. I mean, it was a struggle. And I went over to a meeting in Fort Worth and it was a, uh, um, ICFM meeting and Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland were there, Oral Roberts, all the big names. There was 2,000 people in this auditorium and they had a circular auditorium and in the center section there was probably 25 or 30 seats in the center section without an aisle and I was dead in the center halfway back right in the middle of the auditorium and all of these people were praising God and they were all prophesying over each other and over their ministries. And I was sitting back there, man, we were struggling. It looked like we might die. And I was saying, God, help. I just need help. And when they said, go greet somebody, Pastor Bob Nichols, who wasn't the speaker, but he was hosting the meeting at his church. He got up off the platform, ran down the aisle, pushed his way all the way into the middle 
and hugged me. And he says, don't quit. Don't quit. And he just kept, he just kept hugging me. Everybody else in the entire place had sat down. We were the only two people standing up. And he was saying, don't quit. Don't quit. And you know what that did for me? I mean, man, I thought, God, you know me. You sent Pastor Bob out here to just encourage me out of 2,000 people. He found me in the middle of the auditorium. And man, I felt special. I felt like, God, thank you. That, that just blessed me. Why didn't Jesus say these nice things about John and make him feel good? About this is the greatest man that has ever lived up until this time. This is the one that Mal Malachi wrote about 400 years ago. This is the one that everybody's waiting on. Why didn't he say those things instead of go tell him what you've seen and heard? It just seemed to me like you missed it. That this, it would have been better to, you know, give him a hug or do something, say something nice. Be like Greg. <laughs> Just make them feel good. I never could understand why the Lord responded the way he did. And then one day I was reading over here in Isaiah. This was years later. For years I had this question. And in Isaiah chapter 35, I was just reading. I wasn't even thinking about John the Baptist but I was reading these verses and these were the verses that John the Baptist quoted and said, this is who I am. This is what God said. Man, there's a lot of scriptures about John the Baptist telling him what to preach. And this is one of them in Isaiah chapter 35. And it says in verse three, this is God speaking to John the Baptist. He quoted these verses. So he knew these verses. And it says, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And as I read this, the Holy Spirit just showed me that what Jesus was doing, instead of just giving John the Baptist a compliment, an emotional hug that would have made him feel good for three days, <laughs> as Greg was talking about. Instead, you know what he did? He pointed him back to the word. John, what does the word say about the Messiah? What did the word say would happen when the Messiah come? And you know what? He did everything that was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 35. In one hour, he fulfilled all of these things. Opened up the eyes of the blind, the lame walked, the deaf heard, the dumb talked, and he raised somebody from the dead that wasn't even prophesied here. He just threw that in so there could be no mistake <laughs> that this was God. In other words, he sent him back to the word because, and get this, because he respected John the Baptist so much. He said, this is the greatest man that has ever lived. In Luke, it says the greatest prophet. In Matthew, it says the greatest man that has ever lived. He was greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, greater than David, greater than Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, you name it. John the Baptist was the greatest man that had ever lived. Jesus honored him so much that he didn't just come down to his level. He was bringing John the Baptist up to his level. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse six, without faith, it's impossible to please him. For those who come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So God was trying to bring him up to faith by pointing him back to the word. You know, most of us, if you were discouraged and if you had two doors up here and one of them says a hug or, you know, however you want to describe this, a good feeling, a goose bump, you know, the power of God hitting you from your head and going through your feet and out your toes. <laughs> if that was available in one door and the other one says the word, the promises, most of us would run for the door that has the emotion and all of these physical things in it. And the bad thing that's wrong with that 
is that your emotions don't last. I've had emotions probably more so than most people. That's a relative statement. I know it's subject to everybody's interpretation, but I've been caught up into the presence of God. I have felt the love of God. I've been emotional to the max, but it didn't last. And I don't believe God wanted it to last. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. God doesn't want me to live just on an emotional level. Now, I've, I've enjoyed what's going on here. I've been praising God. I feel the presence of God. It's not like I'm immune to feelings, but feelings don't dictate. When they come and they're good, I enjoy them. But you know what? I'm going to do what God's word says, whether I feel like it or not. I've learned to pray for people and not go by how I feel. Some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen have happened when I felt nothing and I've learned to keep my mouth shut and not say what I feel. I say what I believe. I remember praying for a woman in Chicago that was so bad that they uh, could not bring her down to the meeting. They brought her to the hotel and she was in a wheelchair. She's kind of in a stretcher, a wheelchair that leaned back and stuff. It was like a bed. And she only had days to live according to the doctors. And so they brought her and she was so bad. She was in so much pain. Cancer had just eaten her up. And she could, she could just barely talk. She had so much pain. She was on so much painkillers that she was just in and out of it. And as I tried to talk to her, she would start to say something and she'd fall asleep. And when her chest, when her chin hit her chest, she'd wake up and finish her statement and stuff. And she had only been listening to me for one week on television. And her family had never listened to me. They just were humoring her to bring her. So this woman had only heard a couple of days worth of stuff she knew. Nothing about the word of God. She was so far gone. She was doped up. Couldn't even function. And I tried to minister to her, but she couldn't understand anything. So I just prayed for her. And the guy that was with me when we left the room, I came that close to saying this woman's going to die. Because she just didn't have time. She wasn't there. It was too little, too late. And I just nearly said that, but I've learned not to speak forth anything contrary to what I prayed for. I didn't pray that she'd die. I prayed that she'd get well. And if I prayed for that, I wasn't going to speak contrary. So I didn't say anything about it. And two months later, I was in Houston and a woman came running down the aisle and jumped up on the stage while I was ministering and says, do you remember me? And I said, no. And it was that woman. And God had raised her up. And I didn't feel a thing. I felt like she was going to die. I've learned not to go by how I feel. If I feel great, I enjoy it and I praise God for it. But if I don't feel anything, I'm still going to say and do and act what the word says regardless. And this is what Jesus was trying to do is to bring John out of that depression, out of the doubt that he was in, not by just saying something complimentary about you're the greatest man that's ever lived. Although that would have blessed John, it would have worn off. It wouldn't have lasted. It was because Jesus honored John so much that he didn't just give him an emotion. Man, when the Lord showed me this, this changed my life. Because I was raised in a Baptist church and in the Baptist church, all of the miracles, you know, passed away with the apostles. God didn't do miracles today and he didn't directly speak to people. All you did was get saved and stuck until you went to go to be with Jesus. And uh, there was no such thing as feeling the presence of God and having the glory of God and miracles working. And when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and got around some of these faith people that were talking about seeing visions and hearing audible voices. And Kenneth Hagin would put his hands on people and fire would jump between his palms and things like this. I thought, man, if, if God will do it for them, he'll do it for me. And I was pressing for these things. Man, I was believing God and believing that I was going to hear an audible voice, see something, have an angel come speak to me. I was pressing in in these things. And God spoke to me through these passages and said, my best isn't just some emotional, physical feeling thing like this. My best is the word of God. You know, go back over to uh, Luke chapter seven and look at 
the first part of this chapter is where the centurion, Greg mentioned this this morning, but the centurion came and uh, said, Jesus, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy. Come and heal him. And Jesus said, I will come. And then he sent another servant and he says, look, I don't need you to come into my house. I don't need you to touch the man. You speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And um, he said in verse nine, Jesus said, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. If you read this same passage in Matthew chapter eight, he, it says he marveled at this man's faith. There's only twice in scripture he marveled, once at this man's faith and another time at his disciples' unbelief. He marveled at their unbelief. He, he was amazed that people who had been with him for three years and had seen him do all these miracles and heard the word could be so full of unbelief. And he marveled that a man who wasn't even, you know, in the Jewish nation, he was a Gentile. We would say today, he doesn't even go to church. He's not a Christian that he could have such great faith. What made his faith so great? It was a faith that was based in the word only. You speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Now contrast that with John chapter 20. And this is after Jesus rose from the dead. And in John chapter uh, 20, it says in verse 24, this is the resurrection of Jesus. He appeared unto 10 of the apostles. Judas has al already killed himself, but Thomas wasn't with them. And 10 of the apostles were gathered together in a room. And Jesus just appeared in the room with the doors and windows shut and talked to him. And man, they were excited. And it says that they uh, came and told Thomas about it. But in verse 24, it says, but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Notice, he said, I will not believe. If you struggle with unbelief, you have willed to do that. It may not have been a rebellious will. It may have not have been like, I just don't like God and I'm going to operate in unbelief. But no, it was your choice. You had to choose to believe all of the stuff that's been told you. You had to believe. You had to choose to believe that only what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel is real. It's your choice. You willed it. And you can will to change. Thomas said, I will not believe unless I can see and touch. In verse 26, and it says, after eight days, again, his disciples were with him and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger and behold my hand and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless. But believe him, if he commands you not to be faithless, well, then you can do it. He wouldn't command you to do something you can't do. You can will to believe. You can choose to be in the word of God. And if you get into the word of God, it will bring faith to you and you can operate in faith. And so he says, don't be faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Once he saw, he didn't ever stick his finger into the print of the nails or thrust his hand into his side. He knew Jesus had answered everything he said without being present when he said it. He knew that this was Jesus. He fell down and said, my Lord and my God. And look at what Jesus said in verse 29. Jesus said unto them, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. There is a greater blessing on taking the word and believing it. That's the, word, that's the faith that made Jesus marvel is a faith that says, I don't need to see it. I don't need to feel it. You give me a word 
and I'll believe. Jesus said there's a greater blessing on those who believe the word than on those who have somebody come up and have to prophesy and tell them things and confirm everything and give you three visions and, you know, two cats walk this direction and three dogs walk the opposite direction. And that proves to me. And God, if you'll just have five people come and say this to me, I'll know that it's you. You know, God loves us so much. He will meet people where they are, but that is not God's best. There's a greater blessing on those who believe the word. And when I saw this, my whole prayer life changed. I thought, God, I want your best. I don't care if I ever have anything supernatural happen. I'm going to trust the word of God. And I committed myself to making God's word absolute dominant authority in my life. And did you know from that time, I could be at a meeting like this and they could go down the road prophesying over every person and they'd come to me and skip me and go on. And some people think, well, boy, God doesn't love you. No, God honors me. I'm trying to believe for his best. And I mean, everybody will get a prophecy other than me. And that's not to say that I won't receive a prophecy. I, I had Pastor Bobby uh, Ray gave me a prophecy this morning. Got it right here in my pocket someplace. It's awesome. It says, debt is paid, balance zero. I got it. So I'll receive it, but I'm saying I don't get a lot of prophecies. I don't get a lot of other things because God, I've taken him as in his word and he's taken me at my word and I'm just believing what the word says. And I'm telling you, brothers, I'm seeing great miracles happen. I'm seeing awesome things happen. And this is a key. It's not to say that if, you know, God can't speak to you in an audible voice, that he can't give you signs, that you can't see things in the spiritual realm. All of those things do happen. And I don't despair anybody who does it, but... I'm believing for God's best and faith is what honors God. Faith is what pleases God. Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And faith is believing the word without having to have 10 confirmations. You just believe the word. Now you need to be skilled enough in the word to not take a word out of context and you need to be able to compare it so that you don't misuse it. And I'm saying once you know it's the word of God, once you know that this is what God has said, you just base your life on it. And I mean, there is no plan B or there is no plan C. That's what we've been talking about all weekend is just putting God's word first in your life. The kingdom of heaven functions off of the word of God the way that this natural world functions off of seeds. And John the Baptist, it doesn't tell us what his result to this was. But I believe he may have pondered it a little bit about here I am in a desperate situation asking for help and Jesus just says, go tell him what you've seen and heard. And he may have wondered about that, but I can guarantee you that the Holy Spirit that he was filled with in his mother's womb brought him back to those promises that he quoted from in Isaiah chapter... And the connection was made that what could Jesus do to fulfill the prophecies about the coming Messiah more than what he's done? 
Is there anybody else that could have done this? And he pointed him back to the word and he anchored his faith to the word. And I personally believe that John the Baptist went out with a shout. He went out knowing that I did the right thing. My life wasn't wasted. I pointed people to the true Messiah. And I believe that when Herod beheaded him, man, he was ready to go because he knew that he had run his course. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the only thing that's ever going to give you total satisfaction is to base your life on the Word of God. Feelings come and go. Feelings are up and down. And you just can't, you can't base your life on feelings. You can't base it on external things. All of us go through cycles. You know, when Jimmy Swagger and Jim Baker got exposed for the things that they did and and Jim Baker went to jail and Jimmy Swaggart was exposed sexual things and stuff. Did you know that my income went down 40 to 50% because of what they did? I didn't have anything to do with it. But people put all media ministers in the same basket and they just thought you can't trust them. And I took a hit. It didn't have a thing to do with me. I did not cause that. Did you know that every time we have a national emergency, like when 9-11 happened, man, people's finances go down. Matter of fact, some of my friends that I know, and I, if I was to call their names, you would know who they are. They're world famous ministers. Their ministry nearly folded. And not just one or two of them, many of them. Matter of fact, in Colorado Springs, we have over 200 parachurch ministries. And nearly every single one of those took a dip in their finances because Christians quit watching Christian television and radio. They were worried about what was happening in our nation. And for days or weeks, they were just focused on what was happening, wondering what was going to happen. And out of sight, out of mind. And the ministries uh, just took a hit because of it and stuff. That didn't have anything to do with me. That's just natural things. You go through cycles. And if I was to just go by what things look like and how I feel and all of these things, I guarantee you there, I'd be up and down and in and out of faith. But if you are focused on the Word of God, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you don't have to fluctuate. You know, our sister that's been over here dancing, I forget your name, but I was talking to her earlier today. I just love this lady. She's uh, been through our school. She's an awesome lady, but she told me her son uh, died in a uh, motorcycle accident, I think last June. And she was telling me about how that the police and the people came and they were just, you know, worried about her and how she was going to react. And immediately she was able to start ministering to them, praying for them and praising God. And here she is dancing and worshiping the Lord. And stuff, and that's because her faith is in the Lord. That's not to say that she doesn't miss her son, but she says, I'm going to see him again. I know where he is. He didn't suffer. He just went on to be with the Lord. And uh, man, the word of God will give you stability. You know, Jamie and I had something happen to us that Paul Harvey shared it on his entire worldwide Broadcast, And I remember Wendell came over the next morning. He and Linda drove up and says, you know, we've taken care of your classes. You don't have to minister in uh, school today. And uh, Paul and Patsy were with us 1996 when this happened. And, you know, and I told them, I said, no, I'm going to minister. And they said, you can't minister after what's happened to you. And I said, why not? I'm not going to tell them about who I am. I'm going to tell them about who Jesus is. I said, Jesus is the same. And I went to school and I ministered four hours in school. And I know some of you, you can't do that. You can't do that. If your life is based on the word of God and not based on how you feel. I don't care how I feel. I mean, well, let me rephrase that. I do care how I feel. I don't want to feel bad, but I am not going to let how I feel dictate how I act and what I believe. The word of God is dominant in my life. Not perfectly, but that's my goal. That's what I'm working towards and I'm living by it the best I can. And I can guarantee you because of it, I've weathered storms that would have destroyed me in the past. The word of God will give you stability and strength 
who I am in Christ, in my spirit, I've got love, joy, and peace, and that's all I'm going to act like. I don't care what I feel like. I don't care what circumstances tell me. This is who I am. You know, it was John Olstein that always held his Bible up. This is my Bible. says I am. I can do what it says I can do. And I guarantee you that is absolutely true. I don't care what I feel like. This is what we want you to leave this uh, conference with is the integrity of the word, the power that's in the word of God to transfer your life from what you feel and how you process things in the past to this is who I am. When somebody comes up and says, how are you? Instead of saying, oh man, I hurt all over. I've had this happen. I'm so poor. I can't pay attention. And you go on and you just uh, mention all of these things. Instead, you need to say, well, let me see right here. Oh, <laughs> Ephesians 1, 3. I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings. Amen. I'm above only and not beneath. And I've had people come up and they, they know bad things have happened in my life. And they say, how are you? And I say, I'm blessed. And they'll say, I, I know that, but I want to know how you really are. And I say, I'm really blessed. <laughs> Amen. I am blessed. Somebody, well, I'm just trying to be honest. No, you're just being carnal. You're just saying how you feel. That's not the real you. You've been born again. There's a new you on the inside that is full of love and joy and peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith meekness and temperance. That is the real you. So when you say, I'm just trying to be real, what you're being, actually, it depends on who you consider you are. If you think that this physical body and how it feels and your mental emotional state is the real you, then you're a hypocrite to sit there and say, I'm blessed when the truth is you feel like crying. But you know what? If you consider your born again self to be the real you, you're a hypocrite to go over there and indulge your feelings. And I'm not saying that God hates you for it. It's not bad. That, that is how you feel and God understands. He knows the infirmities of our flesh. He's not mad at you for doing it. But you are living out of your flesh instead of living out of your spirit. Your spirit never has grieved, ever. It is full of love, joy, and peace. It's never discouraged. It's never fearful. It's never full of unbelief. So it just depends on who you consider you are. If you think this physical, natural you is the real you, well, then you're a hypocrite to go say, I'm a world overcomer. God always makes me to triumph. Well, then that would be hypocritical. But if you consider the, what the word says about you and if you, who, what it says in the spirit that you are an overcomer, Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Well, then you're a hypocrite to sit there and indulge your flesh and let it control you and your feelings when on the inside you are identical to Jesus. 1 John 4, 17, as Jesus is, so are we in this world, not just in the world to come, but in this world. Your spirit is ounce for ounce, molecule for molecule, atom for atom, identical to Jesus. You've got his life, his nature, his faith, his healing power. That's who you are. And you've got to get to where you base your life on the word of God instead of just wanting an emotional hug. Now, am I saying that that's wrong for somebody to hug you? You know, when Karen got up here and admitted that, man, she's felt like quitting, I gave her a hug. 
And there's nothing wrong with that, but I guarantee you my hug's not going to last her too long, three days. <laughs> it's the Word of God that's going to carry Karen through. It's the Word of God that is going to make the difference in her life. And yes, we need each other, and yes, we need other things, but you shouldn't ever get to where you become codependent on something in the flesh. It's wonderful to have people love you. It's great when people come up and thank me. And I had a couple come up and say that their son is out here. I forgot what job he's doing, but he's doing some job. And they said, thank you. We've got our son back. I don't know the details, but their son was way off the rails and he came to school and now his life's back and they were just thanking me. That's wonderful when people do that. It makes you feel good. But you know what? That's not going to last me next week. I'm going to have to base my life on what God's word says. There will be something come against me and I'm going to have to stand on what the word of God says. So I'm not saying turn down these things. Don't turn down. Don't isolate yourself and get to where you don't let people love you and bless you and stuff. But don't become dependent upon that. If it comes, wonderful. Receive it. But you need to get to where your word is sufficient. I don't need you to come into my house. I don't need you to wave your hand. I don't need you to lay your hand on my servants. You speak the word only and I'll be okay. That's what God's trying to draw us up to. I believe that the Lord has spoken to people in a supernatural way during this weekend. I think that you've got a... for the rest of your life. <laughs> and I just want to encourage you today to make a decision to put God's word first. To let it dominate you. You can't do that if you don't know what it says. You can't trust on me to just spoon feed you. I can get you started. You can take some of my materials, Greg's materials. You can take the praise and worship and you can do things that will help point you in the right direction. But if you're going to really be strong and mature, you got to learn to feed yourself. you got to get into the Word yourself. You've got to get to where the Holy Spirit speaks directly to you, to where your life is based on the Word, not my life, and you're trying to mimic somebody else. I want to encourage you to put God's Word absolute first place in your life. And it's a process, as both Greg and I have been saying, it's not just a one-time thing, but man, it is a process that is well worth the journey. It takes time. But you know, the good thing is that it takes time to grow, but then it also takes time for you to get into doubt and unbelief. Did you know it doesn't happen just automatically? Once you get this process going, you can get so focused on God that you don't know how to disbelieve God. It really is possible. I was sent for a physical a number of years ago when they were trying to get me to take out insurance and I just told the doctor and the nurse about my son being raised from the dead and man, they were just amazed. They were listening to all of this. And anyway, they made me do one of those stress tests and they wanted me to shave this hair on my chest. And I told them, I said, this is virgin hair. It's never been touched before. I said, you can't shave the hair off my chest. So anyway, they put these six things on me without shaving my chest. 
And I did fine until the 12 minute and 50 something second mark. And then I got to sweating and those things started falling off. So I was holding to it and the nurse was holding to it and the doctor was holding to it and I was still jogging. And anyway, after the thing was over, he got to looking at this printout and he got to frowning and then he started grunting and, and, oh, and, and he wrote out this stuff and he said, here's another doctor. I want you to go over. We're going to give you some more tests. We're going to put you in the hospital and you might have open heart surgery before the day is over. You got a serious heart problem. And did you know? I mean, this just came out of left field and it took me about 10 seconds or so. I just looked at him and find, I just, I thought, that's a lie. I said, that is not the truth. And this doctor just looked at me like, I don't guess anybody else had told him he lied to him. I don't know. <laughs> and he says, what did you say? And I said, that's a lie. You look at that paper and tell me that that says I got a serious heart problem. And he, looked, he says, well, you're just a little bit off, one hundredth off in one spot. And he says, everybody's heart's a little bit different. It could have been an anomaly. He, later I thought about it, it could have been because these things were falling off my chest. <laughs> but he says, you could be okay. I just think we ought to go get you tested. I said, that is not what you told me. You told me I had a serious problem. You told me you were going to put me in the hospital and we might do open heart surgery. I said, you lied to me and I got on this guy's case. And I said, how dare you sit there and say something's wrong with me? And this guy just tore up his piece of paper. <laughs> and he just said, go. And he kicked me out of his office and he failed me on the test. I couldn't get the insurance. And anyway, I've got a doctor that's on my board. So I went down to Louisiana, Shreveport, and he ran these uh, tests where they put dye in your body and do it. And he says, I had the heart of a 17 year old. There wasn't any problem and, and everything was fine. And he told me, don't ever, ever accept one of those tests. They are wrong 50% of the time. He says, never base anything on one of those. And I bet you there's people sitting right here that because you weren't established in the word and you didn't know what the word says and stuff, some doctor just says you got a problem and you fall apart like a $2 suitcase. But man, I had the word established in me and I knew I was healthy and I knew I was healed and I refused to accept that. You know, they just made me sign papers Wednesday for a new uh, insurance thing and I had to go get some tests during the month of December. And uh, they, they did these blood pressure tests and one of them was 182 over, no, 100 and, what is it, 22 over 82. One was 120 over 80 and the other one was one. Uh, 18 over 78. You average them out. It was a perfect 120 over 80. And everything, the guy told me, he says, you know, you are really healthy. And I said, I know it. Hey, Amen. <laughs> I know I'm really healthy. And I'm telling you, the word of God 